New invite people to... No, I don't want to do that. Good morning, Vietnam. All right, my friends. Oh, give it a hot minute here. <clears throat> Warm up the dulcet tones. No. And uh, I will say here at the top of the hour. Mm, no. In Ireland, they would say this is half six. 6.30 is half six in Ireland. So that's a thing. Uh, I was able to see... My dear friends, Ray and Rebecca Clancy, uh, all the way from Ireland, just, I guess, a few days ago. Uh, great to see you guys. If you ever watch this, uh, if you catch this around the way, or even if you don't. Howdy, howdy, William LaHat and the old uh, LaHat crew, uh, which is a crew that's multiplying. That's how we grow the church. Am I right, Will? <laughs> all right, let's go. Um, so yeah, Pastor Ray and Rebecca were in town. Good to see them. Be blessed by just what Ray was sharing about his church and how they're doing. House Bishop has returned. I can only assume that means the Kings will not be making the playoffs. I'm just joking, Nicholas. I know you guys were out of town and you have three, uh, teenage daughters from what I understand. Uh, rumor has it. Is Hazel a teenager? Yeah. Does she? She, it seems like one. Anyways, I'm not going to get into that right now, but it is good to see you. Uh, it's better to see the girls than it is to see Nicholas, but it's still, it's still good to see you too, Nick. Um, okay, a little bit, although that clearly is Nick writing that, not Emily. Um, all right, okay, <laughs> organic church growth, let's go. <laughs> Of course, Hazel is a teenager. Uh, in my world, you know, everyone's a teenager because that's all I, I, I talk to these days, the old teenagers. Uh, those are my peoples. Um, okay, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, Pastor Ray and Rebecca uh, send their love from Ireland. The church there is doing well, doing really well, and uh, thriving even during the COVID lockdowns and all the things. The Lord is good. So if you uh, spare a thought in your prayers for Pastor Ray and Rebecca and the congregation in Calvary Galway, um, they would love your prayers. And yeah, it was just a really nice time to catch up with them and, and to hear how, uh, how I can sort of, you know, continue to pray and be of encouragement to them. But really, they were just an encouragement to me, as so often happens. Uh, house Friendle in the house, good to see you guys. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 tonight, verse first. 12 verses, so make sure you get your Bibles and uh, get to flipping. Uh, I am going to, oh, I did want to say, uh, as we continue to pray for those in Ukraine and the situation there, obviously, um, if you are looking for a way to support or to give um, to uh, reliable, vetted uh, organizations on the ground and uh, those with good access and good reputations as far as organizations and aid um, for people in Ukraine, um, you can go ahead and contact me if you want. I have a, a friend whose family members live there and who's, yeah, has a whole communities of people that he is connected to that lives there. And he recently, I think it was just this morning, I got an email from him. And in the email, which he sent to several of us, there was a list of of reputable uh, aid organizations uh, that that he was like, these are good, safe places to to get help to people in Ukraine um, quickly. So if the Lord moved on your heart to send some aid, some financial support, or, or even to be just aware of some of the organizations and what they're doing and how to pray for them maybe, um, you could go ahead and message me here on the old Facebook and, uh, and I could get you that list if you're interested. So I did want to offer that uh, here um, for those of you who are, I don't know, maybe just feeling like you just want to try to be a little more involved or a little more helpful in different ways. Um, he had provided a good list of organizations in Ukraine, uh, in and around Ukraine that, that are doing good work there. So uh, I trust him completely. And, um, and so I trust the information he gave me and would be happy to pass on that information to you. Okay, so message me if you want that. Uh, DM me, I guess, as the kids say. Uh, I will say, you know, Lent started yesterday, and 
I'm giving up a few things, but I, I was giving up social media. And then like, I don't know, five minutes ago, I was like, oh shoot, I deleted the Facebook app on my phone and I had to like log in. I forgot my password and it was a whole thing. And I almost said to the Lord, I almost said, Lord, if it's just not in your will to have the Bible study tonight, I'll fast from the Bible study. No, um, no, the Lord is good and he wanted us to have a Bible study. So I figured out the app real fast, like an old, old person. Well, I can't get to my photos. Uh, the kind of people that Jess used to deal with, uh, the old Mac Apple store. Um, figured it out and here we go. Okay. I'm going to say a prayer, uh, sing the docs and, uh, and jump into Matthew chapter seven. Uh, some really good stuff. Uh, I hope you're excited for the word and the work of the Lord in our lives. Uh, but if you would first, please join me in a prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the work you continue to do, not only in our hearts, Lord, in our homes, um, in the lives of all who seek you, who ask, um, who plead, who cry out to you. Lord, I've just heard so many stories from friends um, and people connected to um, in the Ukraine that have just been tremendous stories of rescue, tremendous stories of safety for families, protection. Um, I know I know there's a lot of other kinds of things happening as well, Lord, but I just want to be able to acknowledge in the midst of so much uh, sort of devastation and darkness, um, the hand of the Lord is still is still present um, in the land in the land of the living. And so I pray, Lord, that you would continue to extend that right hand arm of power um, on behalf of the innocent, on behalf of civilians, on behalf of families and children, Lord, but on behalf of everybody, Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for an end to hostility. We pray for, um, we pray for Putin to feel the full pressure, even internally from other Russian oligarchs, um, that he would be so isolated as to maybe even be turned against. Uh, there seems to be quite a movement even in Russia itself to possibly finally oust him. Um, Lord, whatever is in your sovereign will that would bring about the conditions of peace, we pray we pray for peace. We pray for those aid workers. We pray for the the people on the ground who are doing their best to help protect and uh, help others escape. We pray for the refugees, Lord. Uh, over a million, I think, have already crossed borders into neighboring countries. We pray for their welcome. Uh, we pray for homes and conditions of some stability for them, especially those with families, those with children who have just suddenly been torn from school and life as they know it. We just pray, Lord, that you would be able to provide a peace by your presence that surpasses understanding and that you would be their home, that that you would be their home as you were for the exiles in Babylon uh, that we read about in the Old Testament, Lord, that as you were for your people um, in Egypt, as you were for your people wandering uh, in, the, in the wilderness, everyone who turned to you, everyone who called out for you, everyone um, who sought the face of God could find it. And so I pray, Lord, that, that you would be found by the people who are desperate, Lord, by by those um, who seek your face, Lord, and, and and even by those who don't even know how to seek your face, that they would be able um, to sense your reality, your presence, and to know that there is a God who loves them and who cares about the daily affairs of men and women and and about the, the, the lives and the struggles and the things that people are going through uh, in a deeply personal way. And that's why... Jesus came into this world. So I just pray that they would know the nearness and the love of our God. Um, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that we have the opportunity not to take for granted um, our safety, the conveniences and the, the luxuries of our lives, but that we would be deeply humbled by our condition. We would be deeply grateful for it. And as Pastor John has said, that we would know that our day will come when we will be put um, to the test, when we will go through things much more difficult than what we face over here at the moment. And I pray that um, we will be able to both celebrate the good as we experience it and and be prepared to be resilient and persevering during, during times of particular difficulty. So we link arms and hearts in common cause with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and in Russia. Um, who are calling on you or serving the body, who are seeking to help and protect and to love their neighbor. And we also know that part of our vigilance in praying for them 
is our vigilance in waiting for you and in following you. And this Bible study is not for nothing, Lord. It is it is how we know you. It's how we come to, to trust you, to understand you, to put the words of your mouth, uh, the words of your teachings that we have been looking at um, and bring them into our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we could become Christians, so we could be saved, so we could be disciples of the living God. Um, that is what we've been called to. And so help us to take up the responsibility to pursue you with all that we have, including just by listening well tonight and asking the Spirit to to, to place these things in deep recesses in our hearts so that they will grow and they will have deep roots and they will change the very way we live and think and have our being. Um, we praise you, Lord. We look forward to the work of the word tonight. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, if you would, please, sing the doxology, our call to worship here on Thursday nights. Um, and wherever you are, uh, even if you have a good voice, a bad voice, uh, you know I can't escape it. You have to hear my stupid voice all the time. So there's no reason that people in your home and general vicinity shouldn't have to hear your stupid voice. Now, your beautiful voice. Do not be, do not be overly concerned with how you sound. Be overly concerned with the God that we praise. If you would join me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 12. Jesus speaking to his disciples, north of Galilee, the Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give, give good gifts to those who who ask him. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. My friends, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Many people have talked about the sort of social isolation that we've all experienced in different degrees uh, in the age of COVID. Uh, a lot of memes about how do we talk again once we're actually around other people. And, um, and then a lot of clips of how unable people seem to be dealing with each other when we're around each other again. And so 
sort of chaos at baseball games, you know, people screaming or, or a video of yet another Karen at a target cashier, you know, trying to rip her mask off and scream about something and everything and, and nothing. We've seen a variety of examples and maybe we've written those, these examples. Maybe you have been one of these examples of the social awkwardness of returning to uh, being around people a little bit more these days. Uh, after being away from people a lot in the previous months and last couple years. But compounding this is something that Pastor John has been talking to us about and I've been uh, picking up as well on Thursdays. And that is the general condition of our cultural moment. Not just a COVID or a post-high COVID or a late COVID moment, whatever it might be, but a, a pseudo-modern moment in which human beings are living lives that are sort of in the real world and very much also uh, shaped by online life and sort of a, I don't want to say cyborg, but like a hybrid reality that we're so online, we're so connected to, you know, news sources or social media or, um, or groups of different kinds or streams of content of different kinds, or even just the entertainment particular sort of like, sort of clusters of entertainment that we consume. You know, are you an HBO Max person? Well, obviously not if you're a Christian. <laughs> um, or are you an Apple Plus person? Or are you a Netflix person? Or, you, you know, whatever. Um, we, we are all online, but we are all online differently. And so it's also led to this phenomenon in which many of us experience life radically differently than the people we sometimes even live next to because we have so many other ways of engaging the world that might be just tailored to us via our phone or, or our laptop or, or what have you. And so in that world, the social isolation we experience can be even more sort of hidden or, or even deeper still, because we might feel that we're actually very connected to people, very connected to the world through news, very connected to, to certain things or events or groups, but what kinds of groups are they? They might be only one particular kind, those who think this way or those who vote that way. Um, and so a lot of times in the same street or the same neighborhood or the same home, um, you'll have people who are actually experiencing radically different and totally sort of isolated realities based on what we are taking in through these sort of hybrid online and real world lives. So it becomes even more interesting or dangerous that when we do actually gather around other people in the flesh, as it were, um, many people are discovering this same phenomenon of sort of the COVID joke. We don't know how to sort of work with each other or talk together um, is being uh, multiplied a thousand fold by this, this pseudo modern hybrid form of life. Um, and so Something like social intelligence um, is experiencing a dramatic dip generally in people's experience. Social intelligence. What is social intelligence? Uh, social intelligence is, you know, in, in the old world it would be called tact um, or, or even just sort of common sense or street smarts sometimes would try to get at it. Um, but it's sort of the ability to be around people in a way that is civil is aware, is uh, able to facilitate uh, and engage and interact with different kinds of people in different kinds of settings. So, so those who are socially intelligent um, develop that ability, frankly, by being around people, the experience of being with people and learning from successes and failures of being around people. Sometimes you've been in a group of people and you and you've done really well and you've, you know, everyone happy you're there and you're, you're able to engage and look people in the eye and keep the conversation flowing. And other times, <laughs> at least you feel, um, you sound like a real big idiot and you, or you put your foot in your mouth and everyone gets a little quiet and you're like, oh, oh, oh that wasn't good. And, uh, and then it just feels awkward and very uncomfortable. And, uh, and I'm sure we've all been there. So social intelligence in the age of sort of COVID and in the age of the pseudo modern experience, social intelligence is one of the things that is taking the biggest hit in human development. 
Um, because social intelligence is something that is really only formed by actually the experience, both successes and failures, of being with people in a way that is healthy and connected and alive. So those who are socially intelligent are those who, for example, can carry on conversations with a wide array of people, not just particular people who think a particular way, but a, a person with social intelligence can carry on conversations with all different kinds of people and know how to use the language that they would understand in a way that would work even around people who might think this way about that, you know, that, that you could be able to adapt to the environment and the people you're around and, and you can carry on conversations. You can talk about life uh, and, and know where to where to go and maybe where to be a little more cautious and whatever, that you have that social intelligence that you could talk to a variety of different kind of people, not just the people that are your people, but you could talk to a wide array of people. If you have social intelligence, if you don't have social intelligence, you really, you can't, you can't even. You can't even. You might not even be able to tolerate standing near someone who doesn't think the way you do. If you if you lack social intelligence, it may be just feel like I just just, just like you know your head's gonna leave your body. Um, but if you have social intelligence, you can carry on conversations with all different kinds of people. Um, if you have social intelligence, you're able to uh, be adept at learning how to play different social roles. You're not always having to be this person. You can kind of see a scenario and a group and. And something that you're involved with, people you're connected to, and you can see, oh, you know what? I, this is a role that I can fill here. Uh, you can adapt to different social roles. You don't always play the same note. If you have social intelligence, you're adept at learning how to play different roles. You know, maybe in this environment, everyone's kind of quiet, and so you'll kind of step up a little bit and, and try to get people talking a little bit more, or everyone's very talkative, or, and so, so you'll just sort of be in a little bit more listening mode and, you know, and just sort of keeping, keeping engaged in that way. You can kind of adapt to different social roles based on the group or the people you're around if you have social intelligence. You, you have a flexibility there of, of being able to occupy sort of different social roles. You're not just like, me only act this way, you must deal with me this way, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, hopefully you never talk like that. Um, so people with social intelligence also are able to feel, therefore, which is probably obvious, are able to feel at ease with many different types of people or personalities or situations. They're not all on edge or all uncomfortable or all awkward. People with high social intelligence can, can feel at ease around all different kinds of people because they're able to, to, to hear them. They're able to, to, to carry on conversations with them. They're able to adapt to, to different roles and, and occupy different you know, spaces in that, in that environment. Um, and so they're, they're more comfortable. They're more comfortable around different types of personalities. They're not just looking for one type of personality or one type of group to fit in with. Um, people with high social intelligence are also known to be excellent listeners. Uh, probably goes without saying the other things sort of connected to this. Um, someone with high social intelligence is a good listener. It's, it's not a narcissist. It's not someone who's only talking about themselves, thinking about themselves. It's someone who, who is interested, aware of, and able to hear other people, uh, even or especially if they are different and have different views or different thoughts. Um, a person with high social intelligence is also, and this is maybe the trickiest one, is also careful or aware of and able to take care of the impression they leave on others. Now, I say the most tricky or the most dangerous because you could be so aware of the impression you leave on others that it's just a form of narcissism. I want everyone to like me, and so I'm going to perform this sort of false, you know, you know, false, you know, self-deprecating humor um, or false confidence or false strength or false look at me. Um, if you're too, too obsessed with how people see you or the impression you have on, on people in a certain way, you can, you can take that in a narcissistic direction. Um, but a person with high social intelligence is aware for all the pitfalls is aware and takes care of the impression they leave on others. Like, you know, do you leave a group and, and were they better for you having been there? Did, did you improve? Did you strengthen? Were you able to encourage uplift? Um, or when you leave, are they like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> Uh, whew, glad he's gone. You know, like someone with social intelligence is both socially aware, personally self-aware of how they sound to others, to different kinds of people. And they care about that. 
They care about how they sound. Now, again, you could care too much about that and become false or fake or performative. Um, but a person with high social intelligence cares about that, but also has balanced that with the ability to be honest and authentic. So, you know, I want to be, you know, who I am in front of you. I'm not trying to pretend or be something fake, but I also do care about the person I am and how that affects you. <laughs> like, you know, so it, that's the most tricky one, but it's also maybe one of the most important ones to be aware of and care for the impression you leave on others without that being an excuse for, for narcissism, but, but being because you, you want to be, um, of, of the good, you want to be of good benefit to those around you, no matter who they are. So you want to be aware of how you're seen and not be naive about that or, or, uh, or uninterested, you know, oh, this is just the way I am. <laughs> Deal with it. I don't care what people think about me. Like that's as narcissistic as saying, I only care what people think about me. Um, so someone with real social intelligence is able to balance that awareness of what people think about you, how, how you're seen or perceived, the impression you leave and, and being authentic nonetheless and, and, and caring about it, but, but also being, um, honest and authentic as a person. As you can hear, um, that's becoming less and less a, a skill, a developmental ability, an art, um, an experience. Uh, many people are no longer around enough different kinds of people at all that they would even be able to develop uh, the trials and errors, you know, that n are necessary to learn how to, to have social intelligence. It's not something you can sort of, you know, study at home, as it were. Um, it's something that has to happen in real life connected to, to others. And so it becomes, I think, maybe the thing that gets um, sort of uh, diminished the most in the age, uh, not only, as I said, of COVID, but in, an, in a pseudo modern uh, moment in which people are, are so isolated with their own ways of being, uh, receiving the world and, and, and finding their own people in that place and only associating with certain kinds of folks. We lose that social intelligence. Now you might say, okay, okay, well, whatever. I, I could see that might be bad or whatever, but as a Christian, this is devastating. Because as Jesus is going to point out to us in the Sermon on the Mount tonight, the gospel, like the, the way that you bring the reality of the Lord around other people is how other people receive the reality of the Lord. Like <laughs> the gospel is social. Like the gospel is social. Think about what John's been saying to us um, about Paul in, in the prison in Rome where he is being able to advance the gospel because he is around Roman guards who are able to see, man, this guy is legitimate, has an authentic life, authentic witness, knows how to talk to his captors. Like Paul has incredibly high social intelligence, but it's not so that Paul will be great. It's so that Paul can make Jesus viable, understandable, accessible, real, in the lives of those who are near him, whoever is near him, Roman guard, maybe Emperor Nero someday, and and maybe maybe beleaguered prisoners or Christians who are sad and depressed, or or Christians who are visiting from other places or who are writing letters to him. Like Paul is able, because of his social intelligence, to genuinely see the advance of the gospel in people's lives, because the gospel is communicated through a person's real life. And so, and so this is why this is not just an interesting social phenomenon. Oh no, we're all losing social intelligence in the age of COVID slash pseudo modernity. Um, this becomes vital if you want to be a true disciple with a Christian witness. That was basically the last thing I was talking about. Someone who has a legitimate and effective Christian witness as a disciple of Jesus has to know how to be a person around people for the sake of Jesus and the kingdom, not, not for the sake of you being, I don't know, networked and, and becoming successful or something. Like this is not some mercenary tact to improve your personal business or something. This is about literally the witness to the gospel in our time. So that's why I think this is so crucial. And that's where we're heading tonight. Jesus talking about the crucial nature in which the gospel and the Christian life must be social and it must be socially intelligent. Okay, so with all that uh, on the table before us, 
we immediately are faced with what have, some have called the most well-known, the most famous, the most popular verse in all of Scripture. And I wish it was another verse <laughs> that was the most popular, the most famous. But here's the one that has a pretty good stake for being, in our time, the most well-known verse in the Bible. Judge not, lest ye be judged. <laughs> or as the NLT says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Our culture's like, yeah, get away from me. <laughs> leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I'm going to go back online. <laughs> you know. Um, so we are immediately faced in verses 1 through 5 with Jesus exhorting his disciples not to judge other people, not full stop, not to judge other people harshly and hypocritically. Not to judge other people harshly and hypocritically. Why? Remember, what good is the salt if it loses its saltiness? What good is a light if it ends up under a basket? If you are to spread the gospel in a way that actually advances the gospel and doesn't just... That's, that's in the Greek. Um, if you are to advance the gospel in the lives of others and those around you, in your home, in your workplace, and in those spheres in which you are engaged with other human beings, um, you, you must be warned immediately by the Lord that you must not judge others harshly or hypocritically. Now, think about how he plays this all out. So he says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye, when you can't even see the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So Jesus is saying a few things we're going to sort of walk through here. Um, up front, he is forbidding. I mean, it is a do not. It is a, and it, the implication is that this is something we almost always do if we're not careful. And so it's like, hey, that thing you're doing right now, stop. <laughs> stop that thing you're continually doing. Stop it. Stop it. Um, and, and what is, what is going on here? Why do we find ourselves so able, almost subliminally, almost subconsciously, almost reflexively judging other people? Like I can just say, like, even as a parent, this is the worst thing in the world, but it's true. Like if I see a dad who looks like he's, you know, I don't know, around his kid, but he's not connected to him or he's not, you know, he's not in the game or whatever. Or he's like staring at like the game and his son's just like, wanting him to look at him or something, you know, like and there's just this moment in my heart in which I'm like, you terrible father, you know, like I don't even like put words to it. And it's just, it springs up in my heart. Like, man, what is wrong with you? Right. Okay. But here's the problem. One of the reasons I probably continually do that if I'm not like on it is because something happens in our hearts when we reflexively judge someone. When we reflexively identify a failure, however small, however momentary, that might be the best dad in the universe. And he might be in the one moment of his week in which he glances up to see, see the score of the game. And that's the moment I saw him not attending to his son, you know, <laughs> or whatever, right? Um, so one of the things that, the reasons that we keep doing that, we all, we almost always have this this just almost reflexive ability to spot people's failures and like to like look at them and be like, what's that? What is, why, why are you doing it that way? That's not right. What's wrong with you? The, the re, one of the reasons we do that is by, by identifying someone's failure, it immediately creates a sense of righteousness in us. And this is really perverse, but it's really creepy and it's really true. Like the moment I think that about a dad who in the moment, just for a minute, might be a little out of the game or be a little distracted from his child or something like that. The moment I do that, what am I doing? In my heart of hearts, I am, I am saying, I don't do that. Or I wouldn't do that. Or man, I'm better. <laughs> I'm better. I'm a better father. Like that's, that's what my heart is doing when it's like, oh, what is, 
look at how sad this is, right? Like, I wouldn't feel that if, if I wasn't like, man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. That's wrong. What is, what's wrong with you? Like, up your game, right? Like, show up for your kid, would you? Stop being such a deadbeat, right? Something in you, when you are able to spot a foible or a failure in someone else, immediately what that does, it almost sends like a charge of electricity into your heart that says better, 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 better. And so, man, all of a sudden you almost get like this, uh, it's almost like an endorphin thing where you're like better, but it's dark. So you're like, you don't want to explore it. You don't want to admit it. But, but why are we so like drawn to people's failures or like, why did she say it like that? I would never do that. Like that's the subtext is, what 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 are you doing? And even if you don't say it, the subtext is, I would never, right? Like, what is wrong with you? I would never, right? And so the subtext is, what is wrong with you? Better, 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 better. And so what it does, it, it it's in identifying someone's failure in the twisted nature of the human heart, it immediately creates a false sense of righteousness. Now, I might just be sitting there. My kids might not be anywhere near me. I might not even be being a good dad in that moment. But by identifying someone who's not being a good dad, I feel like a good dad. Does that make sense? So it can literally be like, I'm not even around my children. But if I see a dad doing something, I'm like, weak, weak, soft. What's wrong with you, you narcissist? Right? As soon as I see, spot, think, feel, it sends this like electric charge. Of better. Better, better. And I don't walk it out and I don't name it. I don't write a story about it. I won't tell anyone about it. But in my heart of hearts, I'd be like, I would never. Better, better, better. And it feels good to identify other people's failures because they're not your failures. So it's this really weird, perverse thing in which we readily, Jesus is like, I'm, let me interrupt what you're always doing. Stop, stop it. And they're like, stop what, Lord? <laughs> He's like, stop judging people so harshly for their failures. And we're like, whoa, better. Why better? Um, what, what do you mean better? Why? I, I don't better feel better. Like we're always, we're always looking for ways in the dark, twisted nature of the human. Think about what scripture says about the heart. It's wicked and, and unreliable. Like who can know it? it it's like you can't trust it. It's because it's got this like wild a number of mechanisms by which it can produce artificial senses of righteousness. Like, I didn't do anything good, and yet I feel better, better, just by spotting failures. <laughs> just, pfft, my gosh, seriously? Ugh, ugh. Oh my gosh. You excuse me. You use that kind of language? What is wrong? Better, 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 better. It just does something really disturbing in us that creates a false, immediate, endorphin rush sense of righteous, 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 righteous. Even if I've done nothing righteous, just by identifying you not righteous, it's saying, I righteous, I righteous. <laughs> Sorry, that's the title for a very bad movie, I righteous. Um, okay, so he's like, uh, stop doing this. Now, I just gave you a little example from whatever. It's me in a you know sandwich shop looking at a dad and a son or something like that. But... What's crazy about Christians is Christians as a group have professionalized this impulse and made this a corporate thing where Christians will get together and be like, ugh, the culture, you know? <laughs> and, and immediately what we're like, we're like, ah, oh, this godless pagan culture, better, right? Like <laughs> immediately look at all this confusion over gender and sexuality, better. Like, look at all these people out there with their fancy cars and their wasteful spending. Better! We have this crazy thing. As a, as a Christian sort of subculture, if you're not careful, that individual false sense of righteousness suddenly gets thousand-folded out in your subculture community of we would never. We we, right, we believe in the family better. You know? We, you know, we would never use that language. And then we're like, and now it's like thousands of voices, you know, Christian, evangelical America, better, 
you know. And so what happens is when Christians are only sort of connecting with each other in mass by identifying culture war issues of what the culture is doing wrong or where the terrible public school system is ruining our children, all that kind of stuff. What's happening there is the group is experiencing this like collective electric field charge of better, righteous, righteous, righteous. Now, we all know if you were to follow Christians home, we get divorced just as often as everyone in the culture. No better. <laughs> we all know if you were to follow us home, we're as sloppy and indulgent with our money as anybody in the culture. No better, right? Like we all know, but if you just follow us home, that we struggle with the same kinds of issues of lust and all the kind of stuff that we're no better. Should be, but so often no better at all. And yet we have an entire sort of way of culturally associating now as a group by identifying all of these failures of our culture and our society. So you might do it at the individual level without like, without being on top of it. You might find yourself, ooh, you know, someone expresses, I don't know, some asinine political view and you're just like, oh my gosh, better. What kind of moron better? Are you better? Right? Like whatever. You might just see something and just be like, ugh, better, you know? Or you might, or and you might also be connected to a cultural Christian body that does that in mass against the culture itself. And, and then sort of has sort of tricked itself into thinking that we as a group are righteous and the culture as a group is unrighteous. When it turns out we as a group have been exposed, particularly in the last decade or two as being radically as unrighteous as anybody in this culture. And so what Jesus says is, you have to stop this. You cannot view other people and other groups of people through the lens of this harsh and ultimately hypocritical standard of moral judgment. The, and Jesus said, and he tries to really scare, like, you know, the heaven into you. I don't know. <laughs> what does it say? Oh, scare the hell out of you, right? He tries to really frighten you with, with things because he's like, he's like, all right, how about this? How about this? The standard you use to judge your culture, the standard you use to judge the people around you that you think are unrighteous, the standard you use to judge other people, that's the standard God will use against you. So if you're going to run your mouth and you're going to talk about this godless pagan culture, get ready. Get ready for the Lord to follow you home. If you're going to talk about how this culture doesn't value marriage, get ready for the Lord to follow you home and see how you treat your wife. If you're going to talk about how this culture spends its money, get ready for the Lord to oversee your bank account and the details of that ledger. If you're going to talk, okay, if you're going to apply a moral standard that is strict for people around you, oh, what are you doing looking away from your child's beautiful face? What's wrong with you? Get ready for the Lord to follow you home. He won't even need to. For the Lord to hang out with you for 10 minutes until you look away because you would rather be distracted by the game than deal with whatever, right? So he says, look, look, do not judge people in that way. Do not be so obsessed with people's failures that you are like on it all the time, that it becomes like part of what you are is this watchdog this moral police over individual or cultural behavior, okay? Hear me, O oh Christian. Do not judge others this way, and then you won't be tracked by the Lord that way. But if you do, expect the Lord to follow you with the same standard of moral judgment that you're applying to others, okay? Now, as soon as you hear that, you should be like, oh, wow, um, and then he and then he kicks it up or he explains it, elaborates it even further in case you were wondering how crazy this looks to the Lord. Why worry? Interesting. We just came out of a passage about worrying and about how worry indicated worship and how our worry was tied to our worship. And if you worry about the things you're actually obsessed with, and he's like, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye, like in your neighbor's eye, in not you eye? <laughs> In the not you eye, why are you so obsessed with that? But you're not obsessed 
with the log, the timber, the, the, the tree trunk, the oak tree growing out of your own eye. Like, why are you so good at spotting other people's moral failure when you are so bad at spotting your own moral failure? Like, why are you so good at talking about family members' issues and you're so bad at talking about your own issues? You see what I'm saying? Jesus is like, what is going on that you're so obsessed with that? Now, I'm going to suggest we get obsessed with that because by identifying a bunch of people's sort of little dust mites in their eye, we're like, better, 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 better. It's doing something really creepy and giving us a false sense of like a hit of righteousness. It's totally fake. It's totally hypocritical. It's not even real, but it's what it does. It gives us this electric charge of righteous, righteous, righteous. He's like, why are you so obsessed with, 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 with what's wrong in how so-and-so speaks? Why are you so obsessed with what's wrong in how so-and-so at the school, you know, you know, does or does not, you know, do this or that, you know, with or around or for the community or, or, or why? What's going on? And then why are you so not obsessed with dealing with your own issues? <laughs> and it's because dealing with your own issues doesn't make you feel better. It makes you feel worse. <laughs> Sorry. There's no way I could not follow that up with. Dealing with your own issues, you're just like, oh, wow, worse. Worse. We don't want to feel worse. We'd rather feel better. So dealing with your own issues, worse. That's why we don't, we don't get so interested because it's like, oh, no. There's a whole lot of them. So we get all like worried and we, and we get all worried about other people's because it gives us this much more immediate, much more satisfying sense, completely false, completely hypocritical, but genuine like rush of better. And then when you actually look at your own heart and you bring your own heart before the Lord and you're like, Ooh, wow, that's not a speck. That is a log. That is a tree. That is a forest. That is a, a timber. Uh, that is a pile of firewood. That is insane. Oh my gosh. The more I look into my heart, the more creepy and sad and weird and, and blind and, <laughs> and worse, I, I suddenly feel. And in a culture that's obsessed with just me and my feelings right now, of course I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel sad. Uh, you know, I had a, a guy I knew. I'm going to call him a friend. I'm going to call him a friend, even if I don't know if he calls me that anymore. Came to church and was like, left church at the end of the service. And he was like, I'm never coming back here. And I was like, wow, <laughs> could have kept those words to yourself. Could have just smiled and waved on your way out. He's like, I'm never coming back here to this church. And I was like, geez, man, why? And he goes, because I go to church to feel better. And you made me feel worse. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Big strong man feel worse, you know. <laughs> I mean, I teased him a little bit. I was like, "What?" I go, "Well, that was just the passage, man. It was just talking about stuff that we got to deal. It's just sin. It's not an easy passage. It's not fun to teach it. I mean, I got to deal with it too." And he's like, "Nah." He goes, "I don't wake up, get ready, and like drive to church to feel worse. I get up, wake up, drive to church to feel better. Our church is supposed to make you feel better." And I was like, "I don't even know where to begin with that." In that moment, I suddenly realized that that guy was just speaking the truth of almost every human heart. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I just want to feel good right now. I don't want to feel not good. And so if it makes me feel good to just sort of, you know, jokingly, but genuinely in my heart, critique the heck out of however you're living, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to do that again and again. And if all of a sudden I got to look at my own stuff, oh, I don't want to, oh, this is not, it's depressing. I don't want to feel sad. Uh, and so I'm just going to keep on keeping that head up and looking at other people, not quite getting it right and be like, oh man, better, 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 better. All right. Good game, everybody. Time to go to bed, wake up feeling a little bit better. Uh, so that's the truth. A culture that's obsessed with the present, obsessed with how I feel right now is a culture that is like terrified to actually deal with our own issues. And so we become like expert detectives and sleuths, Sherlock Holmes of people's micro sins. Oh my gosh. Did you hear, you know, Karen use this word when she was talking the other day and I don't know. I mean, I thought she was a Christian, you know, and, and it's like, it's just, it's just, <laughs> now Jesus is cool, man. <laughs> That's the understatement of my whole life. It's, Surprised I didn't get taken away for that one. Um, Jesus is more than cool, but Jesus is so smart and and he loves people, and so he 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 doesn't just leave it there. He's not just like, what the heck's wrong with you guys? He doesn't just like walk away. You know, these are his disciples. He, it's us. He's like, I love you guys. So, okay. Instead, 
<laughs> we're like, all right, all right. Instead, you know, he's like, okay, instead, what you should do, okay, truly, what you should do is you should deal with your issues. And they're big issues. Jesus has obviously made that comically clear with his illustration. They are, they are oak trees sticking out of your face issues is, is, and, for, and which kind of means like everyone is aware of your issues except you. <laughs> um, so he's like, okay, so what you need to do, don't do that. Don't do this, this weird, like moral police, whatever, pseudo righteous, weird thing. He goes, instead, um, deal with your stuff, deal with your issues, like deal with the things in your heart, deal with your narcissism, uh, deal with the fact that you really don't want to feel bad. So you've been avoiding your issues. Uh, deal with the fact that you might not actually know how to bring your issues to the Lord. And he might want to teach you how to do that, but you haven't really done that. So you're like, I don't even know how the Lord deals with issues. I just sort of feel bad. And then I don't want to deal with them. Um, so, so deal with them and then, and deal with them with the Lord. That's how you deal with your issues. Right? So like, like get closer to the Lord. Um, pray more precisely with the Lord. Take more time being accountable. Let the word have its full effect. Don't hide from it. Don't avoid it. Don't neglect the gathering and the assembly of brothers and sisters under the word, right? Like make sure you're showing up. Make sure you're staying in the way of the word. Make sure you're seeking the Lord face to face. Make sure you're dealing with your heart. Deal with your heart. You got to get to know who you are before, before Jesus. He's not going to leave you worse. He's, he's, he's going to help make you better, but not falsely, but truly. And it's going to take a long time because our issues are very deep, but he wants us to deal with them. And he goes, and, and as you deal with them, like, like when you start to get a handle on them, guess what? Then if there's even the smallest shred of sincerity in you actually caring about someone, you know, like dealing with an issue they might actually have, even if it's a small issue or a thing that really is not the end of the world, but it's just something they're struggling with. Well, guess what? After you take the time and the humility to repent and to bring your issues in your heart before the Lord, suddenly you can see clearly or clearer in, in, in that moral way, in that, in, that, in that spiritual way, you're not obstructed with a giant oak tree coming out of your face. Suddenly you can kind of see, oh, okay, you know what? She's saying that because she's so strict. He's watching the game because he's exhausted and he doesn't, you know, and, and he doesn't get a break. And, and you know, what? I didn't even realize that. And you know what? That's the same guy who shows up and coaches the team and is always there for everybody. And, you know, gosh, man, he probably needs a break. He probably just needs some encouragement. Like once you start to actually deal with your own heart, surprise, surprise, the gospel's social. And you can look around at people and say, man, I see now what is or what isn't the issue. Um, and, and I want to like just sort of encourage or love or help my brother or my sister to deal with a difficulty. And if there is an obvious moral failure, like I, I want to be able to go to them and not be an insane hypocrite by saying, hey, man, I noticed this. And, and I just I mean, we're walking with the Lord together and, and, you know, the Lord has called us to this other place. I just want to encourage you. Like, I know the Lord can help you get there. I know the Lord still takes that seriously. I know the Lord loves you and I love you. And man, I've been dealing with my own stuff. Like all of a sudden you can be a person. Imagine you could be a person with social intelligence. You could be a person who actually could see and hear and relate to another human being in a way that they might be able to receive. Which is not going to happen when you go running around like the culture and public schools, you know, like, all right, so what? Everybody in public school hears you ranting about that and they're like, ah, awesome. So you think I like hate my child? Like, what? Like, what is happening? They cannot receive from you when you are this like bull in a china shop, like swinging a, a two by four around. But when you actually deal with your stuff and you have humility and, and it begins to soften you because, man, I needed the Lord so desperately. And, and they can hear that in your voice and it changes how you, you speak. It changes how you talk to anyone you talk to. And, and, they, and then they can hear, man, this person isn't coming at me like way intense. They're just like, they just really care about me and they're actually offering help. And they, you know, they mean it. They say they, they want to pray for me and, 
And and they're also talking about how, the things in their life that they're dealing with. So I don't feel like I'm just being stigmatized as like the person who's got a problem and they're doing great. No, it's like it's much more humane. Christians are supposed to be humane. We're supposed to be fully human. Jesus was the second Adam, the one who was like the perfect human being. What a human being would look like if he completely was in the Father's will all the time. That's what Jesus is. He's the fully realized human. The perfect man. So when you're a Christian, as you grow and mature as a Christian, you become more and more humane. Not just to other people you agree with, but to all humanes. <laughs> okay? Like, you become interesting and listenable and helpful and and not this like, ah, oh, here comes Dave again. Ah, oh, everyone get ready to feel horrible and... You know, like, it's not like that as time goes by and you're dealing with your stuff. Now, in verse 6, Jesus says, and this almost seems to come out of like, whoa. Um, but Jesus says, don't, don't, after he said like, do, like, help, deal with your issues and then help your brother or sister with their issues. Okay. We're the church, you're the community, you're supposed to reach out, you're supposed to look out for other other people. Don't ignore people. Like it's another kind of narcissism to not care about other people's spiritual growth. So you're supposed to care, but you're supposed to care like as a human, like who actually is dealing with God in your own heart, right? Um, but then he says, okay, so to do that, but then he says, but don't, don't throw your pearls before swine. And you're like, ooh, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They'll trample the pearls and turn and attack you. And you're like, wait a minute. That sounds kind of judgy. <laughs> pigs, swine, dogs, unholy. What's going on here? Well, okay, check it out. He's saying, look, in the first instance, don't be clunky and hypocritical. Don't be aggressive and self-righteous, right? But in this, in verse 6, he's saying, but be discerning. Like, be discerning. One of the points John's been trying to make in, in, in the Philippians passages. <laughs> sorry, cliffhanger. Is that, um, you know, the Christian subculture in America got really into just spreading the gospel. Like, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> beam me all over the world, you know, get my face on television. And, uh, you know, the more millions of people can, you know, hear me, you know, flapping my gums, you know, for the Lord. Like, that's just going to just going to change the face of the earth, you know. Just get the gospel, just throw track, get those tracks and just stick them under people's like windshield wipers, you know, and, and jam them in their doors, you know, it's like, just get the gospel everywhere, you know, and Jesus is like, no, don't do that. <laughs> He's like, be discerning, right? Like, help your friend, yeah, help your neighbor, help people who you're connected to, um, but like, don't just like, assume everyone's just going to be like, oh, Look, it's this random guy. What do you have to say? Well, I have to say all these things that you need to hear about the Lord and you need to repent and all this kind of stuff. It's like, okay, occasionally, once upon a time, occasionally that, that might be something the Lord directs you to and the person might be ready to receive that. But Jesus is like, you need to be discerning. Don't just like try to push the gospel, the good news of like the Lord, spiritual life, righteousness, the call to holiness. Don't just like try to push that on your culture. <laughs> don't if you think your culture is like you know godless pagans or something well he's like then don't try to like force christianity on them <laughs> like what a waste <laughs> if they're not receptive if they're not open it, like that's not gonna be worth the energy to like try to you know like a i don't know like a, a, a military assault of the gospel to just try to steamroll it over a culture or over your neighbor oh, i'm gonna put so many I'm going to put so many Christian signs in my yard. My neighbors aren't going to be able to escape the gospel, you know. The Lord's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that. Don't do that. You have to be discerning. You have to be discerning. And he says it in a way that, like, should get your attention. He's like, don't waste the good news on people who don't want to hear it, who are not ready to receive it. It's not good. It's not good. And so what he's saying is you have to be able, and this is why I want to keep these things connected, you have to be able to see clearly, my friends. Guess what? You're going to not be able to discern if you're going around with logs sticking out of your face 
because you're not dealing with your issues. So you have no ability to discern when someone is receptive to the gospel because you have no social slash gospel intelligence. You can't see body language. You can't see tone you, or you can't hear tone. You can't see any of the cues that someone with social intelligence would be like, hmm, I don't think this is being received very well. You just be like, and anyway, blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, uh, cut, cut. It's not, this is not good. Now he's starting to hate what you're saying. <laughs> At first it was annoying. Now he's starting to hate it because you're not stopping. Like if you are like have no social intelligence, not dealing with your issues, can't discern the difference between I'm with this group of people or I'm with this person. Or this person seems a little bit open is kind of open the door to this. This person is not opening the door over here. Um, well, then don't try to go in and like punch your head through the door screaming about Jesus. Right. He's like, you have to be discerning. And I think it's directly related to. You have to deal with your stuff so that you can see clearly how to help someone who actually will receive help and how to know who is not ready to receive your help. And if you try to force it in that in arena, it's only going to make it worse. And in fact, it's going to make the gospel like like pointlessly unpleasant. It's going to make it feel aggressive, bullying, hyper judgmental, whatever the things are, right? The, the the way that the culture generally reacts to the gospel is because Christians have been just trying to spread the gospel instead of discerning the like specific details of a person, a heart, a moment in which the Spirit's like, okay, I've been working on this person for a long time. This is the time I want you to step forward in faith and encourage them or maybe just pray over them right now. They're ready to be prayed for. If you just walk around being like, I'm going to pray for you and you and you, you know, the Lord's just like, what are you doing? Stop wasting your energy. And now here's the issue. Let's get into the subtleties of self-righteousness. Christians will put out all sorts of pointless, ineffective gospel energy and feel very righteous. I made 50,000 tracks and stuffed every windshield wiper I saw, you know, and the Lord's like, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. What a horrible waste of time and effort and energy. And oh no, what a horribly false, inflated and untrue feeling of righteousness that just filled your heart because you handed out so many tracks nobody wanted, right? Like that is crazy, right? You get that hit of the better because you just put in a bunch of energy and time even though it was completely undiscerning and it was not being received by anybody. And it in fact pushed people further away from the Lord because of how you did it so carelessly, haphazardly, indifferently, blindly with logs all over your face, sticking out of your face. And then at the end of the day, you feel righteous because of all the work you did for the kingdom. Now, my friends, the subtleties of self-righteousness knows no bounds. This is extraordinary. You could be cast in pearls before swine all day and end up feeling like a super Christian. And Jesus is like, no, oh my gosh, no. You have no social intelligence. You have no spiritual intelligence. You're not discerning at all. And let me just push this really close to the, to the bone here, okay? This is true for those who develop a martyr complex about helping people that don't actually get help from help. OK, some Christians will develop. I have to just constantly pour into this person, pour into this person, pour into this person, always show up for this person. And that person is not receiving what you're saying. They're not open to it. They're not changing. What they want is just to exhaust you, use you and then go to the next person to exhaust and use. You have to be discerning or you're going to spend your life's energy on people who are not open to the gospel, not open to the true work of the Lord. Now, I understand going all in with someone in a tough situation, but if you go all in and that person refuses to hear or incorporate anything that you're ultimately saying about the Lord in their life over weeks, months, years, my friends, you're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. And Jesus is saying, be discerning. It's not righteous to develop martyr-like relationships with people who completely take and take and take and take and take your Christian love and care for them and never change and never really listen and never follow through and are really just trying to take and take and take, but are not turning then and actually going to the Lord. They just want to go back to you again and again and again and again. Jesus is like, you have to be 
more discerning than that. You cannot do that. And then certainly you cannot do that and then think, oh, I'm a martyr for Christ and, and I'm obviously righteous because everyone else gave up on, on this person or this scenario. Well, it's, maybe they were being more discerning than you. Maybe, maybe they were like, this is not, this person is not open. This person is not receiving the word I'm trying to give them and encouragement and love. And I can't just keep pouring into someone who is trampling over everything that I'm trying to encourage them in. This is not a good use of your energy. or And it's certainly not an example of social intelligence or discernment. Jesus is like, stop. <laughs> stop it. Like, stop it. Seven, six, man. This is a tough one. This gets really complicated. We get really in these weeds and we're like, no, no, no. Christians are supposed to constantly, always, self-sacrificially, wherever, all the time, never give up on. And it's like, to an extent, unless it's this, unless it's 7-6. Now, what I love is, right after 7-6 is 7-7, where Jesus says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for, keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. But check it out. I'm going to hold these things together. Be discerning. Do not continue to knock on a person's heart who is not open to receiving what you have to say. Verse 7. But do continue to knock on heaven's door with prayer. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Keep on asking God. Keep on receiving, seeking God. Keep on knocking on the door of God, right? He's like, he's like, you may, you need to be discerning and not just waste all of the, you know, the good news of Jesus and the encouragement of the Spirit and all this kind of stuff on someone who is not wanting to receive it, who is just plainly by demonstration, not interested, not incorporating it, using you for something else, but not for what you have to say about Jesus. You have to be able to discern that. But it doesn't mean give up on those people, write them off, you know, draw a boundary in your heart where that person is no longer worthy of love or anything like that. No. In fact, the suggestion I see here in 7 to 11 is turn to the Lord, not go back to the person a thousand times to continue to throw pearls in the mud that they can continue to trample over. Instead, turn to the Lord and ask the Lord for that person. Ask the Lord to soften that person. Ask the Lord to help break through that person because you are not able to do that. And frankly, they don't need you. They need the Lord. So you might need to discern, hey, I am not effective here, but I'm going to turn to the Lord and I'm just going to continue to pray and plead on their behalf to Jesus. And Jesus is the one they need. And Jesus doesn't need me to save them. I am not their savior. And Jesus does not think I am necessary for their salvation in this scenario. But I can turn to the Lord and I can plead for them. I can pray for them. I can ask. I can seek. I can knock. I can say, Lord, just please, please, Lord, continue to go after this person. Continue to soften their heart. Continue to show them who you really are. Continue to show them that there's hope if they would just open the door of their heart to you. And, and Lord, if it's not me, like show me, give me discernment, but I'm not giving up on your work in their life. I'm just going to be discerning about, I'm not able to do that. They're not open to that. And the Lord has warned me not to waste my investment, my energy, my time in the wrong place at the wrong time. He's warned us to be more socially intelligent than that in how we approach and treat other people. But he, he's also said, but you can be ceaseless in pursuing people through prayer. You can never give up on a brother or sister, a mother or father, no matter how close they are to the gospel. You can, you can pray for them morning and evening the rest of your life. And the Lord's like, you should, that's what you should do because they need me. They don't need you. They don't need you to save them. They need Jesus to save them. So you can love them in that way. And that way may be the most effective or the only effective way. <coughs> All right, bring it home. Bring it home. Verse seven, or chapter seven, verse twelve. To summarize, to gather it all up. Sorry, my voice is gone. He says, "Do to others what you would like them to do to you." Right, like golden rule. <clears throat> this is the essence of the law and the prophets. Treat other people the way you would want to be treated, and let's gather all the pieces together. When you have an issue and you need help, man. Wouldn't you want someone to help you? <clears throat> when 
you have a tough day and you're exhausted and you tune out for a second, wouldn't you want someone not to jump on your case? <coughs> when you need to refill your water and aren't sure how long that'll take, wouldn't you want someone to magically appear with water somehow, some way? All right, I'm going to just pray real fast. Oh, Lord, get me through. Okay. What Jesus is saying, wrap it all up. Just be a person. Could you just be a person? Could you just think about what it's like to be a person and be a person to other people? Could you Could you just listen in the spirit? Could you listen to the person? Could you look at them? Could you hear them? Could you adapt to the circumstance and find ways that are effective? Shrewd as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Could you just do that? Could you love them in the way of the Lord? That subtlety that avoids self-righteousness, avoids hypocrisy, that isn't, isn't just trying to feel better, but is trying to help them, love them, that knows when to just turn in prayer and, and when you're no longer the person that needs to be in that situation, no longer the person that can really help them, but the Lord's always the person. <laughs> like, could you just remember at any point in your life, could, could you remember if, you're, if you've had kids, do you remember when you had like that first moment, like, you know, like your first child and, and everything that happened, you wanted to just run them like to the ER because you were like, oh my gosh, you know, he hasn't, you know, eaten in 30 minutes, you know, he didn't, he didn't pee for an hour, <laughs> doc, help, you know, can you just go back there? And, and when, then when you see like a young mom or a young dad, can you just, can you just be there in that place? Can you just be there in that place? And be like, oh man, I remember every little thing. And you got like, you're listening, you're just listening. You're just listening in the middle of the night. You're just listening for any little creak or sound. Like, can you just go back? Can you just be a person and remember what that was like? Can you, can you, can you just be a person? Do you remember what it was like to have a new job and, and to be like, ah, I feel like an imposter. I'm not sure if everyone knows I don't feel like I should be here. I feel awkward and uncomfortable. And could you, could you be a person? And, and then when they hire someone at your job, could you be a person and remember what that was like? And, and, and talk to them and, and know what might be going through their heart? Or could you be a person who who've been a part of the church for a long time, but, but feels like life kind of stagnated spiritually and just kind of plateaued and you just sort of like, I don't know, am I going through the motions? Or did I lose connection with the Lord? Could, could you be a person and remember those seasons in your heart and then, and then look out for a brother or sister that they're not trying to do something wrong and they're not trying to check out? It just it feels a little flat. It just feels a little just feels a little empty sometimes. It's just not it's just not connecting the way it was. That the fire is not quite there. Like, could you look out for them? Like, not jump on their case, but just could you like encourage them with like a just a subtle word? Might not even need to be about that. Hey man, I just I really appreciate that thing you sent me the other day. Or like, could you just be a person? Could you just see other people in the Lord in the Spirit? Could you discern that? Could you know when it's a good time to just sort of you know, lean in and put an arm around, you know, the shoulder when it's another good time to be like, Hey man, you know, the Lord's called us out of that. We got to get out of that. We got to get, I'll help you get out of that. You know, we got to get out of that. Um, you know, could you, could you be a person? Could you be a person? Could you be in the world, but not of it? Could you be in the world for the sake of the world? Could you be a Christian? Could you be a Christian? Could you be a disciple? Could you have a witness? Could you be there for others for the sake of others to love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus says, just think that way. Just live that way. How, how did you feel? How would you want people to help you to respond to you? Could you do that? Could you just do just could you, could you do which exactly what you needed? Could you could you do that could for, the, for them? Of course you could. And in the spirit with the spirit's discernment and the Lord's strength and the Lord's insight and wisdom and, and the life of prayer and all the things he's been exhorting us to man, you could do it well. And you could be a, a presence of goodness in people's lives, wherever they're at, whatever they think and believe, however they live, however they talk. You could be in any circumstance and be a blessing to others as a true and genuine Christian witness. And it might look subtly different from one person to the next because you are actually aware of them and you love them and you're praying for them and you just want to be there for them and to be a help to them. Can, can the Lord do that with us? Yes. Yes, 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 of course he can, and he will, and he longs to. Would you pray with me? Father, help us to recover a social gospel. 
help us to recover that social intelligence that 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 learns decorum that learns the right word at the right time for the right situation to connect with the right heart lord that's that's something we learn we we learn through experience we learn through the leading of the spirit we we learn sometimes by realizing how bad we failed at it maybe that's okay too if we learn and if we learn if we grow help us lord the way you were so expert at dealing with different people at different situations so perfectly decorous in your language to get right to the human heart to exhort and encourage to build up to show mercy at just the right moment to warn with strength and sometimes with real clear even fierce directness at just the right moment where it was effective Oh, Lord, teach us the art of living well with others for the sake of the kingdom of God. I ask that we would all grow in this a little bit more. We would all invest a little bit more in dealing with our own issues so that we could discern and see clearly and hear better and be more sensitive to and more effective with the good gems and pearls of the kingdom of God. Oh, Lord, help us in this area. Help us with this social gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, man, he answered my prayer. I got my voice back just in time and uh, all out of water. So, my friends, thank you uh, for being here on Thursday Eve. Um, I hope the word will bless you uh, as you go forward the remainder of this week. Uh, as always, I hope to see you uh, in spirit and in truth on Sunday morning here at 10 o'clock as we are going through Philippians together as a body. Um, and... Uh, a big thank you to St. Matt's, uh, Father Hayden, Bishop Scarlett, and all the crew here uh, for their hospitality to myself and our church. Um, and as always, my friends, if you have to go, go in peace and God go with you.